Fran Ulmer is the perfect introductory speaker to get this started. She is um, currently President Obama's appointee uh, as the chair of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission. So, uh, and I think she'll say a little bit about that, so I won't say too much. But what she does there is help lead the uh, research and inquiry into what is happening in the Arctic um, on many issues, not just climate, but obviously climate is a crucial issue in the Arctic. Um, previously, and I'm, I'm not going to get this in exactly the right order, but Fran was uh, on the commission that studied the BP Deepwater Horizon spill. She was the chancellor of the University of Alaska Anchorage. Um, she uh, was also a visiting professor and director of a, of a center at the university. Uh, she was lieutenant governor of the state of Alaska, which I discovered today. Um, she served under uh, Governor Knowles, who, uh, in addition to being a Yale graduate himself, his son is an FES graduate. Uh, his son graduated with me in uh, 2009. Uh, and I just, f fair warning, if you, if his name was Lucas Knowles, and be careful when you Google him, because I discovered some things I didn't intend to discover, not about him, but some other Lucas Knowles out there in the world. Um, <laughs> so I, I'll let you figure that out for yourselves. So without further ado, I want to welcome Fran. Fran, thank you very much for being here. And um, this is a great way to kick off the series. Well, thank you very much, Josh, and to the entire team here at Yale that invited me and have made my stay so pleasant, thank you very much. And I want to thank all of you for coming tonight to talk about the Arctic and to talk about Alaska and some of the challenges that we face. It's such a beautiful night outside. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to keep my remarks relatively brief and save time for question and answers so that we can talk about some of the things that you really want to talk about in addition to what I want to talk about and then uh, free you off to enjoy this beautiful evening. When I go back to Alaska tomorrow, um, I'm expecting snow. So I'm, I'm actually looking forward to a little walk tonight myself. So let me, let me begin by saying that the Arctic in general is really heating up in a variety of ways, including media coverage. It's as though all of a sudden a lot of the world discovered that there's a very interesting place called the Arctic. There is a great deal of coverage about it in comparison to how it used to be. And this is primarily focused on climate change, but not exclusively. It is focused on a region that for a long time has been sort of a curiosity, a place where adventurers went, explorers went, scientists went to do research. Uh, but not something that most people frankly identified with unless they happened to have visited there or had some unique association with it. But now there's a lot of coverage. And the coverage, I would say, as a longtime Alaskan, is a little superficial. But what we're going to do tonight is get a little deeper into what is the Arctic, what are some of the changes that are being experienced in the Arctic, and what are the challenges associated with adaptation for society as we move through this period of really radical change. And that's what I want to really emphasize. If you don't remember anything else about what I say tonight, what I want you to think about is the pace of change. Now, the environment and ecology and societies and cultures and economies are always changing. We're not a static anything. What is really significant about the Arctic at this point in time is the pace of change, the pace of warming, and the pace of cultural and economic change that is going along with this ecological change. Warming temperatures, less sea ice, thawing permafrost, vulnerable species, uh, that tends to get covered somewhat superficially. But let's back up a step just for a moment and remember what is the Arctic. The Arctic is an ocean surrounded by eight countries. Let's contrast that to Antarctica. Antarctica is land surrounded by water. Antarctica has penguins. The Arctic has people. And there are many differences in addition to that, but one of the most significant ones as we think about this period of change is that Antarctica is a place where the governments of the world have decided that it is a special place for science and international peace. The Arctic does not have an overarching treaty, anything like that. As a matter of fact, it's a place where the eight Arctic nations that surround the Arctic Ocean have national agendas. 
And they have some very specific ideas about how they want to move forward in the Arctic as it enters this new era. This, by the way, is a map that defines the Arctic as Congress defined the Arctic when it passed, in 1984, the law that created the US Arctic Research Commission. Uh, I, as I mentioned, people live in the Arctic, which differentiates it from what most people think of as the Arctic as a cold, dark place where there aren't a lot of people. But four million people live in the Arctic across all of those Arctic states, and many of them are indigenous people. This is a photograph of Inupiat Eskimo women in Barrow that are, are waiting for the whale to be shared at a whale feast in the spring. Many of the indigenous people of the Arctic, not all, but many, and those certainly in Alaska, have very strong cultural traditions associated with the place where they live. As a matter of fact, what they admire most and love about their space is that it is a very productive ecosystem. It is a productive ecosystem that for centuries really was the way in which they survived without many of the conveniences and without grocery stores and without electricity, remarkably a people that have been superb at adapting to the very challenging conditions of the Arctic. For many centuries, they and other people in Alaska that we refer to as indigenous people, but there are many different Alaska native peoples, live off the land. And we call that subsistence, where you hunt, you fish, you gather, you share. And as you might imagine, now that we are in the 21st century, the cultures are no longer singularly subsistence dependent. They are now mixed cash and subsistence economies, nonetheless. In many places, and this is certainly true in Alaska, but in other places in the Arctic as well, the reliance on a healthy ecosystem and the ability to continue to use not only what is available to you, but to share it and to have your cultural and social networks really be built on that is important for us to remember at the same time we're keeping track of how rapidly the Arctic is changing. All of this depends upon a healthy ecosystem. The ecosystem of the Arctic is fundamentally an ice-dependent ecosystem. In other words, all of the species there, and let's just take Alaska as an example, the Chukchi and the Beaufort as ecosystems where this is very evident, everything revolves around ice. When is the freeze up? When is the thaw? And all of the species that are very dependent upon ice, and that's everything from very, very small things to very, very large things like polar bears are impacted as the ice changes. And again, that's something to keep in mind as we think about the rapid rate of change. So how rapid is this change? So this is just a picture, I'm sure most of you have seen, the contrast between the summer sea ice extent in 2002 versus 2012, one of the years, one of the several years in this decade where we have reached all-time lows in the amount of sea ice in the summer. Let's remember it's still always there in the winter, but it's in the summer that we're talking about a radical change in the amount of summer sea ice. How radical a change? 50% less in extent and 75% less in volume. I'm going to let that sink in for a moment. That is a huge change in a pretty short period of time. And the volume change reflects what is also happening in terms of multi-year ice. In other words, ice that used to be there and would stay there all summer long and that would get built on again as it would freeze up in the fall, but would always be there. Now we're seeing the disappearance of multi-year sea ice, which again has tremendous implications for the ecosystem, for the species of all sizes that rely upon ice as the organizing principle of their survival. So how much has Alaska warmed just as one of the Arctic areas that we will focus on tonight? Um, a rather dramatically four degrees in the summer and about seven degrees in the winter. That contrasts just by way of reference to about one degree of warming globally. So as you can see, the Arctic is warming much more dramatically than any other place on Earth. What does that mean to Arctic residents? Well, we could spend a whole hour talking about that alone, but 
to kind of summarize it in three big ways. The impact on subsistence food that I mentioned earlier and the way in which the cultures of the North rely upon whales and walrus and seals and many other species. The impacts to the coastal villages in the, ex the extent to which their infrastructure may be crumbling because of thawing permafrost. And on the upside, potentially, some economic development opportunities that didn't previously exist, but that might exist now just because of the greater degree of accessibility for some regions as the ice retreats and as people think about economic development opportunities that weren't as readily available when it was colder or more ice present. So let's just draw a couple of pictures in your mind and a picture here to sort of show you what I mean when I describe communities being impacted in a rather dramatic way. Permafrost is permanently frozen ground that has a thin layer of topsoil on top. And how deep that topsoil is varies from place to place in Alaska or in other places where there's permafrost, like Russia. So here you see a picture of permafrost, that's that ice stuff, and a little bit of layer on the top, and a huge chunk that has come apart from the land. So as permafrost thaws, and there is a lot of thawing going on in the north, and as coastal erosion is increasing as a result of several factors, which I will describe, more and more of the villages in Alaska, as well as villages in other places, but this is particularly pronounced and visible to me as a person who lives in Alaska, are losing their coastline. And that means potentially, and in some cases actually, losing their roads, losing a school, losing houses, as they fall into the sea. So why is the coastal erosion happening? Also because of warming conditions. So I want you to imagine the Beaufort or the Chukchi or the Bering Sea covered with ice and a hurricane force wind coming up at 20 degrees below zero. And what happens as that wind blows across the ice versus what happens if that wind is blowing across open water? If it's blowing across open water, you get huge waves. If it's blowing across ice, ice acts like a blanket on the water and keeps down the amount of wave action and coastal erosion. So what has happened with retreating ice and less of that blanket is the wind and the waves can have a much bigger impact on coastlines. And that's what's happening. It's eroding coastlines in some seasons, in some storms, by 50 feet, by 70 feet. So the combination of the warming, the thawing of the permafrost, and this coastal erosion force of waves on the coastline is what's doing tremendous damage to villages and to the coastline of Alaska. So what's happening? Um, communities are talking about moving. So communities like Shishmaref and Nutak and Kivalina and others are actually, they, Shishmaref is a great example, they've voted to move, to relocate to a different place because they have to. They're basically losing their communities. The US Army Corps of Engineers has identified more than 30 villages that in our lifetimes will have to move in Alaska alone. So this is a big deal. How in the world do you cope with this? You can't build walls that will protect these villages. Moving them is prohibitively expensive. Who will pay for it when we're talking about villages of a few hundred people, maybe as much as a thousand people? Will the federal government pay for it? Mm, in an era of sequestration? Probably not. Uh, so how is this going to happen? A big unanswered question, but it is a piece of what we must focus on as we think about how do we adapt life given the changing conditions in the Arctic region. It also means that we have to do a different kind of engineering, designing, and constructing of our infrastructure, roads, airports, ports, buildings, schools, have to be built now with the knowledge that that thawing permafrost, including in areas interior to Alaska, like Fairbanks, they have to be constructed differently. And although this isn't being necessarily required, it is being discussed by the engineering community in Alaska. How do you plan for 20, 30, 40 year building life, knowing the rapid rate of change that is taking place even now as we are experiencing it. 
So it's very challenging to the engineering, the design community, to the construction community, to the public sector and the private sector to adapt the entire way of thinking about how you construct buildings and roads to a very different reality. And one, by the way, that is continuing to change, uh, creating some very interesting problems. I might note that what is happening in the Arctic is not just impacting the Arctic. And this is something particularly for those of you who don't live in the Arctic, I, I want to emphasize that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. The Arctic is, for all practical purposes, a refrigerator for the planet. It makes a huge difference in terms of the weather that you experience in North America. It will, as time goes by, play out in a wide variety of ways that will impact your communities and your life. Uh, again, this is a whole nother hour long lecture about weather and I'm not a climate scientist, I'm not an atmospheric scientist, I'm not an oceanographer, but the sum total, and I'll, I'll give you just sort of the, the elevator speech on this, is that there's a tremendous and important interaction between how much precipitation is in the atmosphere, what the temperature of the ocean is, the extent to which polar highs and polar lows change the jet stream. If the jet stream is moving across North America more slowly, it means instead of a rainstorm that lasts for six hours, it may last for three days, which will have implications with regard to, for example, flooding, or how long a snowstorm lasts in Boston as to how long the Boston airport is closed down. The pace at which weather changes is being impacted dramatically by warming in the Arctic. Again, there's a fair amount of work that's being done in this field right now, and I expect, and I just tune you up to remaining curious about these interactions between what is happening in the Arctic and what is happening in your own backyard. So let's talk a little bit about what's driving all of this. Uh, my, my speech this evening is really not about climate change policy, but as I've mentioned many times, it is about the warming of the Arctic. And I think in the context of where we are right now in this country, but in other countries as well, connecting the dots, so to speak, for people about what is changing in the Arctic, what is changing in your backyard, and what decisions need to be made, not only in the state houses, in Congress, in federal agencies, but in our own lives and the choices that we make is a very important piece of this equation. Even though we're talking about adaptation, we have to take, keep that in the context of the long-term changes that the globe is experiencing. So what are some of the decision points about the adaptation that needs to take place in the Arctic and what humans can choose to do about it? And I would just note, interestingly enough, all of the eight Arctic nations have national strategies that articulate some big picture goals for what they want and hope for the Arctic and how they want and hope to get there. Uh, the United States was one of the last ones to actually do this. In April of this year, the White House came out with a national Arctic strategy for the United States. And you can Google it. It lays out in sort of three big pillars, security, stewardship and international cooperation, uh, some of the hopes and dreams and plans for the Arctic. These three pillars are very similar to the national Arctic strategies that you would find if you went to Google the Canadian Arctic strategy or the Russian Arctic strategy or the Norwegian Arctic strategy. Very similar themes. What is different as you look about all of these is the extent to which they get to the next level of detail about what action will actually be taken for the adaptation, for the planning, for the investment that will be necessary to move forward in the Arctic in a safe way. The one and pretty much only body that brings all eight of those Arctic nations together to do cooperative, collaborative work is something called the Arctic Council. And the Arctic Council has existed since the mid-1990s as a place not where a lot of decisions get made, no, but as a place where people can share information. It has have, had a heavy emphasis on things like sustainable development and on climate change and on 
ecosystem-based management, and on ways in which communities, states, nations, scientists, public sector, and private sector can work together in a responsible way to develop a region that is very both valuable and vulnerable. And I just mention this because it's very timely that the United States is sort of upping its game in the Arctic because we're about to become the chair of the Arctic Council. Canada is the chair now, and in a year and a half, the United States will become the chair. What will the United States choose to do with that chairmanship? For its own Arctic, for the Arctic as a whole, what leadership role will we play on questions like adaptation and responsible development? This is a question to which I don't have an answer, and I'm hoping that the administration will when our chairmanship rolls around soon. But it's an important thing, and I think it's an important thing for we as Americans, regardless of whether we live in the Arctic or live here, to think about what is our responsibility as a leader, as an Arctic nation, to take the Arctic Council to the next level. So how do we do this adapting to what we can see is coming, not just the climate change and the warming, but the, human, the increased human activities as a result of that? And I guess we can bunch them into sort of these general categories of shipping, fisheries, tourism, mining, and oil and gas. That is certainly what the media is covering as it covers what is happening and what may happen in the Arctic as a result of increased access. So how can these things be planned for, regulated, managed, and undertaken in a responsible way in a region that, as I said, is both vulnerable and valuable? So let's explore this just a little bit. But before we explore those, let's just remember what we're talking about here. We're talking about a region that is very challenging. It's very cold. It's dark for long periods of time. It has extreme weather. It's a place where it is very expensive to do business. It is a place where you really need specialized technology if you're going to do it, whatever it is, responsibly. It is a place with very little infrastructure existing that could help you do whatever it is you plan to do or help you get out of trouble if you get into trouble in the Arctic. Uh, and it is a place where, again, there are indigenous people and subsistence cultures that have certain expectations about the social contract between people coming from the outside to kind of do business there and people who live there and have hopes and dreams of their own that they don't necessarily want somebody from the outside telling them what to do. So those are some of the challenges. Now in that context, let's talk about some of these things that need to be adapted, planned for, and undertaken in a responsible way. Oil and gas. It's a big deal. Why is it a big deal in the Arctic? Because the US Geological Survey has estimated that up to 30% of the remaining natural gas in the world and 15% of the remaining oil in the world is in the Arctic. And you know, that old saying about follow the money, well, follow the oil. Where there is oil, you can bet that there will be an interest in exploration and development. And there certainly is, even now, even as we speak. There has been development for quite a while, particularly in some places like on the shore in Alaska or in Norway. But there is a lot of hope that there will be a lot more by many people who are very, very interested in the development. Just to give you sort of a timeline of how this has happened in one place, in Alaska, I'm going to show you the difference on this map between what kind of oil development we had in 1968, in 1977, in 1989, and in 2001. So you can see sort of what happens when you begin to explore and develop, the infrastructure grows, and you have to be very thoughtful about how you're doing that to make certain that what you are doing is not negatively impacting the environment. There is a lot more development that is on the cusp in the US Arctic. The Department of Interior has leased both in the Chukchi and the Beaufort, and Shell and ConocoPhillips and Stat Oil have been pursuing the possibility of additional exploration there. 
that has raised concerns about how it can be done safely, particularly given that it is offshore versus onshore. Now, for a long time, there, of course, has been a controversy associated with additional onshore development in the Alaskan Arctic, and that's usually teed up in the context of the Alaska National Wildlife Re Refuge, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, the National Petroleum Area. But for many Alaskans, the concern is even greater associated with the development in the Chukchi and the Beaufort, simply because it represents a very different kind of technology that will have to be deployed. What are most people most concerned about? Of course, they're most concerned about is if there's an oil spill, are we ready for it? This is one of the documents that the US Arctic Research Commission, which I chair, has recently produced, which looks at this question. What science has been done to explore how you would clean up a spill in the Arctic? And this report, which is available online at arctic.gov, and I do actually have one copy, and we'll go to the highest bidder. Um, it basically looks at what has been done by either the public sector or the private sector, by oil industry, by government, by anywhere. I mean, Norway, Finland, anywhere. And what are the remaining questions that haven't been answered? And so that is the concern, that is the challenge, and that is very much on the minds of people, whether they live in the Arctic or other places. So that's sort of sort of the oil and gas development arena. And before I leave this, I just want to say the Pew, Pew just came out this week with a call to action for Arctic-wide oil and gas standards to kind of up the game on whether that development takes place in Russia or Canada or Greenland or Iceland or Alaska. And for those of you who are particularly interested in this topic and curious about this question of should we be developing it in the Arctic at a very different level? Should we be adapting our regulatory regimes, recognizing how challenging this region is? So I would just urge you to take a look at the Pew report that just came out uh, two days ago that raises this question about Arctic standards. So what about shipping? That's a lot of what gets covered in the, in the media, right? This very intriguing idea that instead of things being shipped through the Suez Canal, or the Panama Canal, that things might be shipped over the top. So again, let's start with the basics. The green line is the Northwest Passage. The orange or yellowish line is the Northern Sea Route. These are two very different places. The Northern Sea Route goes above Russia. And for many reasons that we don't have time to go into, that is far more likely to be the shipping route than the Northwest Passage because of ice, because of transport, because of availability of icebreakers. Russia has 37 of them. We have one, one and a half. Um, it, it's just, for a lot of reasons, the more likely route. And already the shipping has increased, I won't say dramatically, but substantially, in the Northern Sea Route. So some people are saying, oh, this is going to be a major shipping route. I would just say, maybe not quite so fast, because there are some significant things to remember about it. Again, remember, it's only during the summer that we're ice-free. It's still icy, <laughs> fall, winter, and spring. So can you really change the shipping economics, the logistics associated with the shipping industry for a few months? It's an interesting question. Um, not to mention there's very limited charting, limited mapping, limited infrastructure. So yes, it will increase. There's no doubt in my mind that that's true. The extent to which that happens and what kind of ships it will be, uh, all of those things, I think the jury is still out. But, but yes, there will be more shipping. Um, what is challenging is the adaptation of the business practices of the shipping industry, whether it's shipping oil and gas or shipping anything else, to this area. Back to our theme of adaptation. Adaptation for an industry means thinking about what it is, not only that's unique about that place, but how it's changing. And as we've talked about many times tonight, the pace of change is dramatic. So things that need to be done, increasing the mapping and the charting, building more infrastructure, more ports, more refuge areas, uh, adopting the IMO mandatory polar code so that ships have to meet a certain standard if they are going to ship in the Arctic, training the people who will be working on these ships so that they're actually able to deal with the ice conditions because you can get ice at any time of the year. There are a lot of things associated with the adaptation if this industry is going to move forward. 
and not to mention the law of the sea treaty that the United States needs to adopt, has yet to ratify in the US Senate, unlike uh, over 140 other nations that are moving forward, I might add, under the law of the sea treaty to prove up their extended continental shelf claims, which the United States will not be able to do until we ratify this treaty. That's another hour lecture that I will spare you tonight. Um, so let's talk a little bit about fisheries. It's another thing that sometimes gets covered. In some areas in the Arctic, there are already fisheries. Of course, um, North of Iceland, uh, Norway, et cetera. But in the US Arctic, uh, the federal government has imposed a moratorium, a moratorium that basically recognizes we don't know enough about fish populations in the Chukchi and the Beaufort to sustainably manage a fishery there. And that's a wise move. So at least in our neck of the woods, that moratorium is sort of treading water, shall we speak. We're holding until we do more science. And there are certainly people who at the State Department and in other places are trying to get that kind of a moratorium considered by other nations in the Arctic as well particularly given that there are a lot of things happening in the Arctic that we don't even understand fully. For example, ocean acidification. As more and more CO2 is absorbed by the oceans, and as we know, cold water holds on to CO2 more than warm water. Uh, I just think of a Coke that's warm versus a Coke that's cold. Um, obviously, acidification in Arctic waters is a significant concern in terms of what that does to a wide variety of species. So again, it's best to be cautious, use the precautionary principle when we're talking about fisheries in the Arctic. Shipping, as a, it also includes tourism. This number actually stunned me when the US Coast Guard gave me this estimate of 200,000 cruise ship passengers in the Arctic this summer. Given the lack of infrastructure and the lack of ability to respond in case of an emergency, like, oh, for example, you know, the coastal Victoria. I mean, it just is crazy to me. But at any rate, that's what's happening. And all of these things, I think, cry out for us as responsible people to adapt not only what we're thinking about might be possible, but to be doing the planning and the very area and region specific regulation, adaptation of regulation to accommodate the very challenging conditions of the Arctic. So as we adapt to the future, what do we need to do as a society? A lot of things differently than what we are doing today. And one of the most important things, I think, is simply admitting my very first point, which is how rapid the rate of change is happening in the Arctic and how rapid that rate of change is likely to impact places beyond the Arctic. So planning for it is absolutely essential. How do you make good decisions about any host of these things? I think you have to do the science, you have to do the research to be able to answer the fundamental questions about how are ecosystems changing and what kind of technology and engineering designs will really work given these changing conditions, <clears throat> given the punishing conditions of the Arctic. Um, research, unquestionably, is a piece of the answer. And as research budgets shrink, and particularly at this time of sequestration and concern about budgets, it is happening at just the wrong moment, if you ask me, when we really have to be making decisions about how we move forward, not only in the Arctic, but in other places where adaptation is essential. So let me just close with a brief word about the US Arctic Research Commission before I open this up to questions. Um, the commission, as I mentioned, was created by Congress in 1984, largely with an eye toward giving advice, giving advice to the president, to federal agencies, and to Congress about research priorities in the Arctic. And we do that in a variety of ways. We do that by publishing things like the goals report, which is at the back table, which kind of describes for you some of the key areas that we think are incredibly important for additional investment in Arctic research. We do it by doing special papers like the one that I mentioned on oil spills in ice. We do it by convening groups, by, work for, uh, by having basically task forces, by having working groups, 
by convening different federal agencies that need to do a better job of talking to each other and sharing their resources as they do their Arctic science plans. There are a lot of ways in which we tend to be uh, facilitators to try to get people to get the most bang for the buck possible with the Arctic research dollars that we have. But we also want to make sure that people are aware of the research that has been done so that they don't simply duplicate it or so that they don't say, gee, I don't know the answer to that question, so I'm just going to wing it, whether they're in the public sector or the private sector making decisions. So we do something called the Arctic Update. It's a daily electronic newsletter, all things Arctic. So for those of you who care about the Arctic, and I guess to a certain extent, I'm going to assume that you're here tonight so you care about the Arctic, go to arctic.gov and you can sign up for the electronic newsletter, which will every single day give you just a little snapshot of what's going on around the Arctic. What's happening in Greenland, what's happening in Finland, what's happening in Russia. Not just Arctic research, but also public policy pronouncements, major investments, new initiatives by private sector. Uh, it's something that could be a useful to tool to you. And the other thing that you will find at arctic.gov is a portal that is a portal of portals to other places where you can find information about current Arctic research. Again, part of our mission is making certain that whatever research is being done is readily available to the people for whom it could be relevant as they try to make better decisions about the Arctic, about their lives, about their businesses, about how they're going to invest additional Arctic research dollars. So both of these things, the Arctic Science Portal and the Daily Update, are available at arctic.gov. So in closing, let me just end where I began by saying that the Arctic is a very special place with some very unique ecosystems, some very challenging conditions, some amazing opportunities, and a place where the rate of change, the pace of change, is happening so quickly that it is hard for humans to really comprehend. But if we want to be responsible stewards of a place that is as special as the Arctic, it's incumbent upon all of us, those of us who live in the Arctic, but those of us who call the United States home, and let's remember the United States is an Arctic nation, it's incumbent upon us to use our best available science and our most creative thinking to be able to adapt to what lies ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you.